Thanks very much, Tom. I'm afraid uh, you may have expected to get Mark today, but Mark is giving another talk, I'm afraid, so you've got me. Um, so I've done some work with Mark and, and Graham ongoing, actually. Hopefully, we're very nearly finished on some of the uh, kind of predictors that we can look at for paradoxical reactions. So this today is just going to be a broad overview of a little summary of HIV, summary of HIV in TB, and then some uh, paradoxical reactions and HIV uh, virus. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we'll talk just a little bit about kind of the dual burden of disease, um, touch on TB prevention in people with HIV, and then it's World TB Day, uh, both through ART and uh, IPT, and then a little bit about paradoxical reactions and about um, the uh, given the uh, A little bit on the pathogenesis, but not so much because it's still evolving very much and there's a lot of ongoing work about uh, management and prediction. So I'm sure you've probably been shown many of these slides all, all morning, uh, but just to kind of emphasize that uh, this is where we think about it when we think about TB and HIV, and certainly there's an awful lot of ongoing work and research there, but we shouldn't let's all forget this whole area up here, here, particularly for people in the UK, uh, of interest particularly with MDR TB, but up India and China, in terms of overall TB burden, we're far away the, the maximum burden of disease is. And even though TB and HIV has got a very high mortality uh, combined, if you look at the world macro slides, which sort of represent geographically uh, the proportion of people overall in the world that die by, by uh, the, the total population, uh, I mean, Sub Saharan Africa is very much overrepresented compared to other parts of the world, as is West Africa, uh, but certainly India is, is where the, the big burden of disease is. And that's probably. Twofold because we probably for a long time not looked very hard for HIV in India and China, and certainly there, there is a big burden of disease in total numbers, if not in uh, prevalence, uh, that contributes to that. So even though this is what we were talking about today, uh, don't forget that, that um, HIV very much exists in India and China too in terms of co infection. Brief recap about HIV, which you already know, I mean, Sub-Saharan Africa is disproportionately uh, affected, but there is high prevalence, certainly within uh, London, if you look at Lambeth and Southwark, for example, it's got a prevalence of about 1.8% of the 18 to 64 year old population, so that's higher than most of West Africa, and it equals bits of East Africa, so uh, certainly within London, I'm not sure what Johannesburg's total prevalence is, but it's probably pretty high as well. Similar. Um, and again, each year in, in, in Russia, uh, increasing prevalence, particularly among the injection drug users. Uh, and again, this is a world backwards slide showing the proportion of all people diagnosed worldwide and where they live. So, again, just to, to point out that even though really Africa, there is quite a bit in Europe, and again, India is, is very, very highly. Uh, Represented so in terms of total world numbers, even though the prevalence isn't that high, then we don't see it very much in the literature or in props. You know, you must think of, of India and increasingly China, where I think the HIV prevalence is probably disproportionately low because of the lack of testing that, that goes on uh, routinely. Where do people have both TB and HIV? I mean, again, predominantly it's Sub Saharan Africa, but there is a reasonable amount. In, in Latin America, and in fact, anywhere you look, apart from the really, really, really high prevalence areas, I think it just goes nicely to show that TB and HIV go hand in hand together wherever in the world they are, even in, in parts here that you may think are, are built very low in HIV prevalence. And this is some of our local data. So this is uh, overall kind of numbers uh, of uh, people in different worlds, the proportion of people who are infected overall TB who are, who are HIV positive. So, probably until the beginning of, of, of the, the last decade, about 10 years ago, we had seen this started off around about here, and we'd seen a persistent rise and a lot of the, the TB coming back into the UK was very much thought to be as part of people coming in with undiagnosed or diagnosed HIV and undiagnosed TB, and then re kind of generating their, uh, their TB as their immune function declined. Now, that probably isn't the case anymore. In fact, you know, we've got, had a very persistent decline, uh, both in London, matched overall by the rest of England, Northern Ireland, but 
of six times in a proportion of people who are uh, HIV affected. And I think this again perhaps goes slightly to, to the kind of counterintuitive to the public perception where I think the kind of positioning that is with a lot of uh, Africans coming in with, with uh, co-infection. Just to remind you all of which I'm sure you already know about uh, the progression of, of HIV disease. So people are most infectious uh, when they are newly infected, so you get very, very high detection for the year. The, over the upper the road, uh, detection, which at the moment we have is 10 million, probably from the radio above. So people get acutely infectious, and this is certainly where a lot of risk uh, for HIV is in, in London at the moment. I didn't put a slide into it, but our London HIV uh, trouble at 2000 has been going up, and I think it's static. It's not a couple of last two years, and then suddenly we're seeing it go up again. We know that in our MSM population, we have about 1,000 people infected each year. We've had that been reasonably static since about 2003. Uh, 2012, we saw 1,400. 2013, we saw 1,700. And it just looks like it's sort of heading up a little bit. Well, yeah, it's heading up like that. Um, so we're seeing very, very kind of rapid increases, and it probably is because of. Uh, ongoing transmission when people have got very high, uh, very high risk uh, when they're initially infected. You also then get CD4 decline, and that can be really quite rapid uh, at initial infection. In terms of when we start treatment, this will probably guide uh, changes in, in treatment guidelines in the future. A lot of people think that then the nadir of CD4 that you have in the initial dip, not just the, the nadir of CD4 as you get uh, towards the end. Your uh, disease years after you've been infected is probably quite important for a lot of oncogenic uh, viral related diseases, possibly with regards to uh, the HIV response itself on the brain, on the heart, on the cardiovascular effects. And also, this massive rise at the start probably is contributing to a rather viral HIV in sanctuary sites. So, think very much like ALL, where you've got um, CNS uh, sanctuaries in that that is very much the same as HIV. Particularly as we see at least anecdotal case reports about cure, although the Berlin patient who was the ALL person who was uh, cured from blood marrow transplant was actually doing that at the beginning of this year. His family are cured, is that, that we, we, we can tell anecdotally in the case literature are, uh, are not sustained, but we would hope. Um, but I think very much these things will, will, will monitor um, and will, will affect what we do with our HIV treatment in the future. Um, the status now is start anyone symptomatically on, uh, on treatment, in fact, anyone asymptomatically, regardless of CD4 count, as of 2012. <laughs> and in the UK, we can start people now if they're in a primary infection. It's difficult for us to pick that up, and most people who think I can kind of drawing the line here, our average CD4 uh, on diagnosis is increasing, but it's still about 350, so we're just about getting people on, so we need to go on to, to ART. So this is where uh, TB uh, really kind of Another option is mucinistic infections will really uh, come into play. So years, uh, at least one year down the, down the line of diagnosis to, to eight years, where you get a gradual increase in viral load, um, which finally is kind of it escapes as people begin to get constitutional symptoms, mucinistic diseases, and death. And if we look at what risk people have, some people will argue with some of these, but essentially above 500 we think is very low risk. There's ongoing debate in the UK as to whether we start people on ART between 350 and 500. That may change, it may change to be more representative of the states where we start people at any CD4 count. But certainly above 500 is very sort of low risk of HIV related diseases or mucinistic infections. Or again, the long term implications of uncontrolled viral replication, particularly for <coughs> cardiovascular systems where um, effects on CNS are disputed at the moment. And then between 200 and 500, certainly your risk of symptomatic HIV disease, uh, and then risks of kind of low level of genetic infections, oral candidiasis, obstructive oral candidiasis, perhaps, and uh, Kaposi sarcoma, which is HPA. As you then drop to under 200, that's where most of your main risk comes in CCP, certain fungal infections like Clostridium coccy, and then the main, main risk here. So as you get up under 100, probably under 50, and you get CMV retinitis, you get your MAC, you get cryptococcal disease, toxoplasma, 
there's some evidence recently that you get more severe forms of extracoronary TB. The TB clearly can affect it, can affect it to any TB4 client, uh, although it is an AIDS defining illness, so it's quite different if you have TB at any stage of CD4. If you're, if you're HIV, you, you, you have AIDS with a coding table that meets the criteria, but as your CD4 increases to less than 100, there's some suggestion that we get much more severe extracoronary TB, particularly in your CNS, and a disseminated disease. We all know, you know, how you get TB. You can originally control it once you uh, are exposed through lung inhalation uh, with your own natural immune system. But as your defenses weaken after months a year, uh, your disease plan uh, becomes cavitatory and, and, and infectious and uh, get lung destruction. But if we look at what happens in the HIV negative versus the HIV positive population, there's a big difference. So roughly on average, from if you've got latent TB, you've got about 0.2% chance to, to go on to progress to, to active TB each year. Now there's some disputed facts to this, particularly about immigrants and the HPA uh, are very keen on identifying people within the first couple of years of, of moving to the UK, but there's evidence that the risk is much more increased in the first couple of years. Uh, on settling here, that's a folk that it's about 10 years down, down the line. But if we accept this 0.2% overall yearly progression, uh, then that goes up to 8 to 10% per year uh, with HIV. Overall, in terms of global burden, we've got approximately 10 million infected each year, and about 1.5 million of those are HIV positive. Uh, about 2 million die, and about a quarter of those, again, are, are in the HIV positive uh, population. So there is more morbidity and mortality among the HIV than, than the non-HIV. But in terms of overall infections to, to mortality, it's not that, uh, it's certainly not that everyone with, with, with HIV very likely to, 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 to die as a result of those who are HIV uninfected. But the main problem is, is transmission. So when you've got high HIV prevalence settings, you're much more likely to be exposed to TB uh, than you are in non-high prevalence settings. So therefore you've got 20 times more likely, if you're HIV negative or HIV positive, uh, to, to get exposed to the latent infected and then to, to subsequently become actively infected if you're in HIV high prevalence setting. Uh, and that's because of the, the level of co-infection. So there are lots and lots of people who are, who are contacted and probably lots of people, not necessarily asymptomatic, but certainly with changes on their, their x-ray that are not particularly uh, convincing of TB. They may be smear negative and the vast majority of sub-Saharan Africa doesn't have any capacity over and above smear. So they don't have culture and they certainly don't have uh, sex like peanuts or anything else that's uh, likely to, to be able to pick up on that disease. And it was initially called, this was probably in the era of pre-ART or, or an ART coming in, but in like 2003, the WHO called it a curse cure because you, you're four more, times more likely to die within the first year uh, of diagnosis if you're HIV infected. Just to remind us that we should be testing absolutely everyone for uh, TB before HIV. Uh, we're doing reasonably well. Um, so certainly in Sub-Saharan Africa, that, well, the European data is, is missing, but generally in Europe, it's good. In the UK, it's reasonable. There's probably a divide in that London. It's incredibly good, and as you go north, perhaps where very much they see far less co-infection, the the uh, the fall off on on, on HIV testing is, is significant. And even though we're doing well, we're probably over five ninety percent, certainly not five hundred percent. The ones in red are over seventy five percent. So certainly in West Africa, South Africa, they're doing well. Maybe in Russia, but again, the two big, very high prevalent countries. Uh, for TB, probably is much more co-infection than we think that there is. And again, that's just due to, to lack of testing. So this is coming out of then risk of HIV as your CD4 declines. As we know, you can get TB at any stage of CD4. Can we quantify that risk? So Steve Long in uh, Cape Town has done quite a lot of work looking at the changes in CD4 count and TB risk. Now this is modeling work. It's not like 100%. Uh, definitive, but it's shown again that this is your CD4 of it, as you saw before, you get this massive dip after you're completely infected, and then it picks up again, and then you get this very gradual decline. Uh, and then the, the idea being once you start your antiretroviral treatment, uh, that will gradually pick up again. Probably not to a normal level, or you do see people certainly get, go back up to 800 to 1000, uh, but certainly if you've had a very low nadir, you may expect to get up to 200, up to 300, certainly above the risk of when we might like. I think you're at risk of opportunistic infections. And he's done this nice bit of work to 
quantify this with your risk of TB. So your relative risk very much correlates to, to your CD4 count, but only after a certain kind of cutoff point. So probably when you're getting down to about 300 or less, six months in, uh, your risk certainly starts to increase and then exponentially increases as your CD4 count goes down. Uh, and then once you have been thrown in there, so you actually get a very, very immediate uh, reduction in risk. So, so certainly the, the two kind of main goals of preventing TB among high prevalence HIV settings are ART and also as an of preventive therapy. To look into that a bit more, uh, he's done some other work. And this is looking at uh, tuberculosis incidence in HIV positive and HIV negative patients and the cause of mortality. Uh, and what he's shown from this is that at high CD4 counts, if you give isoniazid uh, preventative treatment, then you can reduce your TB incidence by about 64%. Uh, in patients who've got positive skin tests, they're likely to activate their latent disease and into, into active TB. Um, so when you've got people who are kind of immediately uh, infected but haven't really progressed to a low CD4 <coughs> nadir, IPT is most effective. But then you look at the meta-analysis of, of, of studies, and this is regards to ART, um, and at low CD points, CD4 plus your ART reduces your TB mortality by about the same, about the same effect. So essentially you get 60 to 70 percent CD4, IPT is most effective, and that's because of that previous graph where you've got that sudden increase in, in, in uh, lack of relative risk once you get started on ART. And at low CD4 count, ART is most effective. So, this was kind of the, the prompt that for most of Sub-Saharan Africa, where most people will get picked up with the near CD4, certainly uh, under 200, probably about 100 to 300, that we should be starting people immediately on ART, and then once we've done that, we should follow with IPT. Uh, and this is just some further modeling work to show that uh, as your CD4 goes up, uh, you get less benefit from getting started on ART. So your ART risk is, uh, is, is lower than higher CD4. Again, just giving more weight to the fact that we should be studying people earlier. And there were two studies that looked at this, and this shows us that then leads on to, to IRIS. So, um, and it was very much under de debate as to when we should start ART. Uh, Safet showed that uh, two months versus delaying it to the end of TB treatment uh, was very much high mortality benefit. So, this arm is the delayed uh, sequential you got your TB treatment and then your ART. And this is if you get ART starting after two months. In fact, this arm was discontinued um, with the Reddy analysis. So you are much more likely to survive if you start ART two months into your TB treatment than waiting till the end. So with media, they looked and showed that a two week start was far better than an eight week start. So again, this is eight weeks, this is two weeks. So that kind of brought it back further. So we should be definitely starting at two weeks rather than, than eight weeks. And then Stride looked at two weeks versus eight weeks, and again, it showed the delayed AOT up at the top, uh, having slightly kind of higher mortality than, than the low AOT. So this is all suggests that we should start at, at two weeks. But particularly in the Stride data, if you were very heavily immunosuppressed, so if your CD4 count was less than 50, then you got far more TB arms uh, with your earlier ART than the late ART. And even though the, the drive generally, therefore, is to start much, much earlier, there's a mortality and a certainly morbidity risk of getting iris, not just with TB, but with other undiagnosed uh, opportunistic infections if you start ART. Uh, again, this is some Steve Long group, and this just shows that if you start people um, uh, very early on, regardless of the CD4 counts at uh, TB diagnosis, essentially you start them uh, near enough immediately within two weeks, Get a much higher higher risk of iris. So this is people treated with iris, and particularly if your CD4 count is less than 50 in this arm, you have a much higher risk of iris than if your uh, CD4 was, was marginally higher, at less than 100. So you've got this kind of difficult balance that we want to start people on ART because we know that far and away has got the highest mortality benefit, and it's also got the um, best benefit of protecting them not just from TB but from other opportunistic infections. But there's a severe risk of having uh, TB arms if you start them immediately. And we don't yet know both what to do about that, how to predict that, or how best um, to, to kind of quantify who's at risk. So, ARIS, I'm sure you all know a lot about ARIS, so immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome. So, 
So it's a clinical worsening or a new presentation of disease, and it doesn't have to be TB, and it can be Christophe disease, it can be um, a variety of other genetic infections, after the initiation of ART. And it's thought that it's not by no means certain that it's because you get recovery of disease-specific immune responses. Uh, so you get the MAC, you know, you get the herpes viruses. Uh, the onset usually is days to weeks after ART initiation. So again, again, that's not 100% uh, definitive. You can see people uh, months, even years uh, later, having having a paradoxical reaction. And it's a diagnosis of exclusion. There are no laboratory criteria. There's no individual predictors of risk at present. There's no prophylaxis recommended. You need to make sure that you're not missing something else. Um, and the treatment is largely symptomatic, including either steroids or if you've got a particularly bad node, if it needs uh, drainage, then, then uh, it'll be symptomatic to exclude the, the treatment there. So this is based on the, the kind of cryptococcal work, uh, Demantis' definition of what ART is, and there are two forms of ART essentially. So you've got the paradoxical ART, which is very much like paradoxical reactions in the non-HIV population. And this is where you've got definitive diagnosis of TB before starting ART. There are appropriate treatments, so i.e. it's not undiagnosed by as of resistance and you've got them on standard quadruple therapy. This is that we've got them on the right on the right therapy and that we've done well initially, so they've had good clinical response. And then when you start ART, there's no worsening of symptoms. We don't really know why this is. Maybe it's due to the fact that it's a CD4 direct responses, so maybe it's the CD4 interferon as they're woken up and you suddenly get more of a uh, response to the antigen that's there, so some recognize that gene. Maybe it's the kind of cytokine chemokine uh, response that, that uh, we haven't as yet quantified cases on. No, although there's a lot of work ongoing to try and identify markers of this. And this is very much what we see in the non HIV population as a paradox reaction when you start them on treatment. And again, maybe sort of weeks to, to certainly within the first uh, six to eight weeks of treatment, you, you sometimes end up and see a paradox or worsening. They got better. Than art it was, we just know it was set up on largely the right treatment, but maybe a bit of steroid might be useful. Then there's the unmasking iris, which is where you haven't recognized the disease in advance. So this is where in TB uh, or HIV contracted people or HIV infected people in any setting, but, but when we do it in the UK for HPV, for cryptococcus, for, for TB, uh, and that should be absolutely done in any setting where you'd like to start ART. You need to screen people for things that might react once you once you can uh, improve their immune system. So you need to be screening them for HIV contraction. You need to be screening them for anything that's latent that, that or subclinical that could uh, erupt and cause significant difficulties when, when you start ART. And so the, the, the diagnosis here is after you've, you've started the ART. What causes it? We don't really know. Uh, this is kind of recent review. Um, which was looking at the immune pathogenesis of TB. Uh, and we think ours is caused by this excessive unbalanced inflammatory response. But is it the CD4 cells that, that are suddenly producing uh, kind of cytokines or interferon once they've become awakened? Is it that there's something to do with the antigenicity that's suddenly uh, been identified? Is it for some other reason? It's probably a mixture of a host uh, TB response that's maybe modified by. Uh, some genetic factors, but what we, we don't particularly know at the moment. The pathogenesis is certainly far from uh, from being clear. There have been work on a variety of different cytokines that have shown that there, there is some uh, kind of things that you can measure at least that, that show that they're higher in, in Irish patients than in non-Irish patients. So IL-10 and IL-22 are in, in South African study which should be elevated in TB and IL-10 compared to match controls. Then they looked at some uh, MDR-TB, um, there's a decreased TH1 response, uh, probably mediated through interferon in IL-2, uh, and that may be a sort of ART manifestation, and increased IL-10 is seen in drug-resistant iris. Maybe that's to do with the, the burden of pathogen in drug-resistant iris, that there's more of it around, therefore you're more likely to get iris and drug resistance than not, again, we're not quite sure. Uh, about that. This is marked slide just to show sort of what, what typically you see with, with paradoxal iris. So you, know, you get diagnosed, uh, your symptoms very much decrease, you get to see this improving uh, benefit. You've already had a you know, very strong diagnosis here and you know that you're on the right treatment. Then you start your IRT and your symptoms suddenly increase and then largely they will settle down by themselves, uh, either with or without any kind of symptomatic treatment. 
if we look at the IRS and the ART trials, uh, I won't show all of this, but the IRS overall is quite significant. So if anything up to a quarter of people will get IRS. In relation to timing of the TB treatment, the, the early arm, in pretty much all of them, has much more um, delayed arms. So we know that starting early is bad in the sense of IRS, but probably good overall in mortality benefit. I think we have not quantified which is better to get. And again, the CD4 at this line is, you get much more of it when you've got lower CD4 than a higher CD4. Again, that's really difficult because these are the people that will categorically benefit the most from early ART initiation because we know the lower your CD4, in each day you're not on ART, the higher your in mortality. So I think that this is a sort of delicate balance that will probably be played out over the, over the next uh, weeks to months. This is some work that Ronan Breed has done uh, looking at prospective uh, analysis of uh, paradox reactions in HIV infected and HIV uninfected. Um, and we find significant amounts of paradoxical reactions or ARG in both people who are uh, HIV negative uh, or HIV negative and HIV positive. We find worse severity in people who are HIV positive. Uh, and the the median time wasn't, wasn't that much different. Um, you got more PR in the HIV population when you had pulmonary TB. Uh, and actually negative PR was more commonly seen in lymph node TB. <coughs> this is all a bit subjective because obviously you can see lymph node paradox reactions much more rapidly progress than, than in HIV positives. Uh, and there was no association with disseminated TB. Uh, and in his setting, uh, we saw a lot of it, 42% after uh, ART. Um, but what was interesting though, it was 14% with no ART, and that pretty much uh, is what we see in, in, the, in the normal population. So in the literature, um, you know, it's well known to occur non HIV uh, affected people, and we see about two to sixteen percent uh, by uh, a literature review of non HIV infected uh, TB patients. So, so the paradox reactions definitely happen and definitely look out for them. Uh, as we saw in the severity of the disease, so it's a grade three. It's much more severe if you uh, have got uh, HIV than <coughs> if you don't. These are just some slides. So, I mean, this is a very inflamed, inflamed uh, node. This is kind of the sand cold abscess. But by no means does the, the measure of inflammation of scar necessarily affect TB uh, or affect your chances of PR. So, once started on treatment, uh, you get a flare, and this is what happens two weeks down the line. So, really big angry. And these are the people that really benefit from having uh, bursting scars and, and uh, having full lung screening. You've got tuberculoma, quite small here. But after starting ART, really worrying. And these are the people who really don't know what to do about TB because probably they're already on uh, steroids because they've been started with a TBM. You know, they've probably got lots of millions of little tuberculums and how many of them have got things going through inside. Probably a lot, so they actually don't look for it. Um, and then what do you do when they get bigger? Maybe this happened a lot before anyway and it's just kind of dying, but we don't know. But when it is like that, what do you think of doing? Pulmonary disease. And again, we probably don't pick up on this that often because we don't maybe do serial chest x-rays <laughs> very often on people. So maybe this is kind of what would happen naturally and, and it's actually on the diagnosis a bit of a position. We don't see it that often. Uh, so I'll finish on what we recommended in the UK for people who are kind of HIV infected. So we stray a little bit from uh, what's recommended kind of globally. If it's under 100, we say start as soon as possible. Now, so you're much more likely to get a paradoxical reaction or TBRs, but we say start as soon as possible because we think the benefits are, are outweighed by your mortality benefit of being on ART in a setting where we can manage paradoxical reactions, we can manage ARGs, and we can have the ability to follow up people. It's unclear in settings where you can't manage people as, as readily as the UK, whether that's possible. So we say start whenever. If you're above 100, as soon as practical, but if there are problems and you're worried about it, you can wait until after two months particularly if you think that drug interactions or uh, appearance or toxicity are a problem for, for dual treatment. And then if you're over 350, it's essentially whatever the, the TB Commission wants to do. Um, so we're a little bit different from the, from the UK, but I think the main points are, generally, with HIV, your problems occur most, particularly for IRS, and also for risk of exit prolonging and severe TB 
when you've got a low CD4 count, but paradoxically your benefits of ART initiation are greatest at, at, at that moment. So <coughs> it's a delicate balance, and I think we'll see this evolve over the next couple of years as to when is the best part uh, and the best point to start. Uh, any predict errors? There's a South African study looking at predicting errors. And uh, they treated people with anti TB treatment and traditional ETB meningitis. And then they looked two weeks uh, later once they started ART. They saw actually 47% that was predicted by BCF neutrophil count, positive culture, and high uh, pigment alpha and uh, low nutrient gamma in uh, CSF. So, there's some work to suggest that we might be able to predict ARS, but then this is only one study in a low, low number of people. Um, and there's other ongoing work that's looked at um, so CFCM 9 and 10, IL 6. There's other cytokines, uh, uh, CFCM 4 and 5 have been implicated, uh, lots of other CXRs have been implicated. So I think this is a very much evolving work, and it may well be that at some point in the future we'll be able to assess someone at the baseline depending on the symptoms, maybe some of the blood counts, their ethnicity, and we'll be able to come up with a, an algorithm for predicting who we should monitor more closely, or maybe giving preemptive uh, steroids to. Or not there yet. So that's it. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Quick question. Um, if, with your group of uh, infections, um, are you getting? Are you seeing TB HIV co-infection in bullets across HIV patients? Based on where they come from? Yeah, as in, is it sort of maybe more your African roots or your MSN or your MSN roots that are at least higher risk? So definitely in your in your yeah. your your pre your country prevalence is probably the greatest predictor of high at risk you are, um, and your country prevalence of co-infection. So if you're an HIV positive patient from somewhere with a low prevalence, you're not necessarily more risk than someone who's HIV negative from a high prevalence. And you're certainly not as high risk as someone who's HIV positive from somewhere with a, with a high prevalence. So your, your, your country prevalence, probably far enough, is the greatest predictor of, of how likely you are um, to, to progress to. So if you're, a, if you're from a low income country, you're at higher risk if you've got HIV than than, than your Yeah, than, than your baseline population, but you're certainly not. Uh, you're, you're not at higher risk necessarily than someone who's HIV negative from a high prevalence country, which is why they're trying to get, the HPA has done a lot of work looking at screening a bit of, because the entrance screening in the UK at the moment is, is quite strange. So we screen from um, countries with a very high sort of background prevalence, but we don't screen necessarily from the impotence and competence because the background prevalence isn't so high because the absolute numbers are high. So, um, but yeah, it, it's, your, it's your country of origins prevalence, particularly co-infection prevalence, that probably is, is your, your risk. Um, there, well, so lots of people have tried uh, kind of different immunomodulatory agents, uh, including, am I a mouse going blank? What's the nasty one? That, I wonder whether they tried multiple tests, but they, no, they tried with Texan, but the one that gave people with short limbs. Uh, uh, so, you know, so people have, you know, <laughs> so, so I think all manner of immunomodulators have been tried, um, certainly multiple tests. Uh, I think we're talking about possibly it's been tried, but I, I mean, it, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't think in a big sense because it's not. I think there's been lots of in vitro stuff on a whole variety of things, um, but I know Martin Lucas has been tried in, in clinical settings, uh, and I think there's a little bit of evidence from multiple tests, steroids are far and away, but they really aren't sort of a, a lot of this will just be ad hoc people, you know, giving a bit of something that they think might work rather than any enrollment into. Prospective trials. And prospective trials are very difficult. I mean, ideally, it would be good to get a prospective pro forma where you don't have to randomize someone, but you can have standardized follow up to see what, what might 